Good morning. My name is Reverend Amy Seifert. I'm the pastor of Central United Methodist Church, and I welcome you to worship this day. We are back to worshiping completely online right now through the end of the year because of the rise in COVID numbers here in Douglas County, Kansas. And so uh, I'm glad that you are here today, and um, I hope that you will continue uh, to worship with us online as we prepare to enter into this Advent season. We would ask that you would leave a comment uh, with your name, where you're watching from, and who you're watching with, if anybody else, this morning, so we can register your attendance and know who is joining us and from where uh, we are, you're joining us this week. Now that we are back to worshiping completely online, uh, communication will uh, be really important right now. We send a weekly announcement sheet be, um, via email or by regular mail as well that let, lists everything that is going on here at Central United Methodist Church. It includes a list of uh, prayer concerns and joys that we are celebrating. If you would like to receive this and are not, uh, please give us a call at the church office. You can find the number on our website, which is lawrencecentral.org. Uh, give us a call and let us know, and we will make sure that we get you added to that list. But for now, it is time to worship. And so I invite you to join in our call to worship that will be led by Reverend Liz Evans. This is the call to worship. Sheep and goats are welcome here. Saints and sinners are part of God's world. Come, rejoice in Christ Jesus, who welcomes us all. Come, share in his grace, that we all might become sheep who feed one another, who show compassion and love, who offer comfort and mercy, who give as we have received. Come, rejoice in Christ Jesus, who welcomes us all. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? The words will be on your screen. Glorious God, shine upon us with your spirit of wisdom and truth. Enlighten our hearts. Help us to know the hope to which we are called. Reveal your ways that we might share hope and joy in all that we do and all that we say. In the light of Christ's love we pray, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Come Ye Thankful People Come. The words will be on your screen. Praise the Lord. 
Good morning, I'm Liz Evans and I'm the pastor of youth. As we enter a time of prayer, I'd like to remind you to please watch your weekly announcements for joys and concerns. Please join me in the prayer of confession. After that, there will be time for silent prayer and then I will close us. Let us pray. God of glory, we do not always see your glory in the world around us. When we see a person in need, it is not easy to look him in the eye. When we hear a cry for help, it is not easy to offer her quick assistance. When we know of a lonely prisoner, it is not easy to make that unannounced visit. Forgive us when we fail to see you in our everyday lives. Forgive us when we are afraid to act, afraid to care. Encourage us, God of glory. Help us to see others with the eyes of compassion, that we might be your loving presence in the world. Gracious and loving God, as we enter a season of gratitude, we are keenly aware of what's missing this year. Loved ones who have died, those we've lost to COVID-19, the big feasts and gatherings we love and look forward to, the events over the last year that have been canceled, and just seeing people in person. O oh God, as we grieve at this time for all that we've lost, we ask that you would comfort us and wrap us in your love. And yet we know, O oh God, of all that there is to be grateful for. We give you thanks for the ways you have nurtured and sustained us through this time, for technology that allows us to be together even when we can't gather, for the love of friends and family that we can feel even at a distance, for essential workers and those on the front lines fighting COVID-19, for our health and access to health care, for the creativity and gifts in each of us that have gotten us through this hard year. Grant us wisdom, O oh God, to see all that you've given us, Guide us to share the gifts we've been given with those around us. Nourish us for the work of embodying your love on earth, that all would know your gracious gifts of justice, joy, mercy, and peace. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God add a blessing for the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. We have spent the last couple of weeks here at Central looking at some different stories that come from Matthew's gospel. Two weeks ago, we talked about the parable of the bridesmaid, and the lesson of that story is that we need to be ready. We need to be prepared for when the groom, for when Christ returns. Last week, we talked about the servants and the talents, where the master gave talents to each of his servants and two of them went and traded their talents and earned him more, but one buried his talent in the ground and did nothing with it. And the lesson from that story is that God gives us gifts that he expects us to use. He wants a return on his investment. Well, today we look at what happens when Christ does return, when the master is here, and we all have to have an accounting of what we have done. And he uses the analogy of sheep and goats. Now, if you had to be an animal during biblical times, it would be preferable not to be a goat. Well, for one reason, there's that whole scapegoat thing. The scapegoat was the goat over whose head the high priest Aaron confessed the sins of the people of Israel on the Day of Atonement. And then that goat symbolically bearing their sins, was driven out into the wilderness where it probably became dinner for a hungry lion. Now, of course, one might argue that being a sheep could be equally as dangerous. A sheep, after giving up its wool, often appeared on the dinner table or in the stew or on the altar as a sacrifice. That said, goats in the Bible clearly are not viewed as sympathetically as sheep. And the New Testament singles out goats for unwelcome, excuse me, unwelcome treatment as well. When talking about the final judgment, Jesus speaks of separating sheep 
from the goats, and it's clear that the goats are the losers in this sorting. Now, for a shepherd, separating sheep from goats isn't difficult. Though both species are often pastured together and they are similarly colored, they are easily distinguishable from each other. Goats are thinner than sheep. They have different eating habits. Goats brow browse on leaves and shrubs and twigs and vines, while sheep graze on grass and clover. Goats are curious and they're independent by nature, while sheep prefer to stay put with the flock. Goats have hair, sheep have fleece, and a goat's tail stands up while a sheep hangs down. Now, of course, as Jesus goes on with his discourse, it's quickly evident that he's not actually talking about animals. He is using sheep and goats as an analogy for humankind, which is likewise sorted into two groups at the final judgment. Sheep, the people on the right, and goats, the people on the left. But the ones on the right are welcomed into the kingdom of God, and the ones on the left are told to depart from Christ's presence forever. The criteria for the sorting, however, have nothing to do with which way one's tail points. Rather, they have to do with whether or not one has been merciful and helpful to those in dire straits. Those on the right, Jesus said, have actually ministered to him by their compassion toward those in need. And those on the right, excuse me, those on the left have actually ignored him by ignoring the needy. Now, one of the striking things from this account is that unlike sheep and goats, those who have loved their neighbor and those who have not can ultimately only be distinguished by the Son of Man, who serves as the great sorter of this story. Even the doers and the non-doers of good deeds don't easily recognize which are which, and the members of both groups are quite surprised to learn which one they've been sorted into. As commentator George Buttrick put it, the loving folk were so lowly that it did not occur to them that their daily kindnesses could ever have been a personal service to the king or that they have done anything worthy of reward. The unloving were so callous, their religion so perfunctory, that they never thought of Jesus as being linked with humans in love or as asking from anyone any forthright deed of compassion. Now, there are several things that we can hear for ourselves in the judgment story. One is to recognize that our sin of omission can be just as serious as our sins of commission. The passage reminds us that we don't do what we don't do can be as great a reflection of our commitment to follow Jesus or lack thereof as what we do. Some may hear this story as a call to serve others in a specific way. Many good works have been done in the world because some Christians have seen this passage as a model for how love for one's neighbor should be put into action. The Kentucky Mountain Housing Development Corporation is a church-related nonprofit agency with a mission to provide safe, decent, and affordable housing for low and very low income families in southeastern Kentucky. To date, it has provided homes for more than 1,300 low-income households with new construction and home renovating projects. The organization was founded by the Reverend Duane Yost, and when asked what prompted him to start it, he explained how he had been pastoring a church in the area and saw the wretched conditions in which many people lived. And then he referred to this story from Jesus about serving the least of these, and said that he heard in that call to do what he could to help. Now, not all of us are called to form a mission agency, of course, but every Christian can hear in these words of Jesus a reminder that doing good deeds is, a, is an essential part of our faith. Comedian Stephen Colbert put his own spin on today's gospel text. In 2010, he and farm workers teamed up for a campaign called Take Our Jobs. Farm workers were tired of being blamed by politicians and anti-immigrant activists for taking work that should go to Americans and dragging down the economy. 
So the group, along with Colbert's help, encouraged the unemployed and any others who wanted to join them to apply for agricultural jobs. Colbert spent a day picking beans with migrant farm workers, and in September 2010, he would testify about his experience in Congress. He did the whole shtick in character, sounding pompous and insulted that he had to pick beans, until someone asked him why he chose this particular issue to come to Congress about. And he broke character for a moment and said this, I like talking about people who don't have any power, and this seems like one of the least powerful people in the United States are migrant workers who come and do our work but don't have any rights as a result. And yet we still invite them to come here and at the same time ask them to leave. That's an interesting contradiction to me. And you know, whatsoever you do for the least of my brothers, and this seems like the least of brothers right now, a lot of people are least brothers right now because the economy is so hard and I don't want to take anyone's hardship away from them or diminish anything like that. But migrant workers suffer and have no rights. Biblical commentators sometimes point out that this account, as Jesus told it, gives a one-sided view of Christian life, making it sound as if the whole of it is just doing good deeds. The final judgment, as described here, seems to look only at whatever Look, excuse me, look at whether or not one has loved one's neighbor. It says nothing about whether or not one loved God, sought forgiveness of sins, or embraced Jesus as Savior. Judging from this passage alone, a non-believer who is compassionate to his neighbor in need is on the same footing as a believer who does the same. But of course, Jesus wasn't trying to give a full description of the final judgment but rather to make a point about not ignoring the poor, the economically depressed or oppressed among us. At least part of what this account implies is that having our sins forgiven should result in a greater willingness to love our neighbor. Certainly, the doing of good deeds does not eliminate the need of forgiveness for sin, but there can be no lasting faith, no love of neighbor without actually acts of doing good deeds. This judgment reminds us that the arena of faith is daily life. The goats had separated their commitment to Jesus from the doings of daily life. But in reality, we, the place we live our faith is in the sheepfold of our daily lives. In other words, the story tells us that compassion belongs in not only extraordinary circumstances, but also in our ordinary and everyday encounters. We need to hear that because most of life is not played out on the big stage in the kinds of events that make national news. Rather, it happens in the smaller things, the chance meetings, the routine places, the circumstances where when we do a good deed, it seems to us so ordinary that we think it's hardly worth mentioning and certainly not worth of earning us a place with sheep. One more thing to hear from this account is that God has provided some directions for living. There is a sign that reads, this life is only a test. If it had been an actual life, you would, been ha you would have been given further instructions on where to go and what to do. We can perhaps identify with that, especially when we think of the number of unexpected circumstances that arise in life where we have no clear idea of how to respond and we have to do the best we can and muddle through. But there is a sense in which these words of Jesus are instructions about what to do, at least in circumstances when we see someone in need. We should think of what we would do if that person were Jesus and then do it. For in helping that person, we are really helping Jesus as well. There's an old story that illustrates the spirit of this passage pretty well. It's about a boy living in a children's home. And for grace at the dinner table, the superintendent usually prayed, Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let this food to us be blessed. After this happened several times, the boy said to him, You always ask for Jesus to come, but he never does. Will he ever come? The superintendent said, if we really want him to, 
he will. The boy thought, I really want him to, so I'm going to put a chair beside me tonight so he'll have a place to sit when he comes. That evening during supper, there was a knock on the door, and standing there was an old man, poorly clothed, cold and hungry. The superintendent invited him to join them for supper, and he pointed to the empty chair. The man sat, and the boy gladly passed food to him and even shared from his own plate. Later, the boy said, Jesus must not have been able to come himself, himself. so he sent this man in his place. Our good deeds are not by themselves a means of salvation, but they do put us in relationship with Jesus, whether we recognize it or not. The one thing we should not hear from this account is the idea of God as a cosmic scorekeeper, keeping some sort of database where he tallies up the exact number of our good deeds. And it's unlikely that Jesus wanted to paint God that way. It's also unlikely that he was telling us to rummage through our memory and conscience to decide when we last did a good deed so we can keep score ourselves and decide whether we are a sheep or a goat. Jesus was probably not trying to scare us by talking about judgment either. More likely, he was trying to get our attention in a dramatic way and communicate that God really does want us to love our neighbors as ourselves. He really does want us to keep working at it, to not excuse ourselves, to not assume that somebody else will do it, and to not as, to act, to not act as if it doesn't matter. It does matter. That's probably why Jesus used such dramatic language in this story. To those on his right, those who have unknowingly served him through good deeds to others, he says, come inherit the kingdom. To those on his left who have unknowingly ignored him by knowingly ignoring the needs of others, he says, depart into the eternal fire. Depart and come are strong words, but rather than lose ourselves in them, the ones better to remember from this story are these. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Amen. I would like to thank everyone who has continued to, to faithfully support the ministries here at Central United Methodist Church with your tithes and your offerings. We uh, appreciate you continuing to do this and rely on these gifts uh, to be able to continue to minister in, even during this pandemic time. And so uh, if you have not had an opportunity to do that yet, there are a couple of different ways. If you would like, you can mail a check to the church. The address uh, will appear on your screen. You can also give online by going to our website, lawrencecentral.org. If you scroll down about two thirds of the way, there is a button that says giving. And if you click that, it will take you to a safe and secure site, uh, which you can use to give online. Let us bless and consecrate the gifts that we have received this week to God's glory and use. Would you join me in a prayer of dedication? We offer these gifts to you as food and drink for a hungry world, as clothing and shelter for those who are naked and homeless, as kindness and compassion for those who are most in need of mercy. Transform these gifts that they may be your hands and feet in the world. Send us forth as your people that in all that we do and all that we say, may be a glorious representation of your presence in the world. With gratitude we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements before we end our time together this morning. As a reminder, we will be worshiping completely online through the end of 2020. At that time, we will see how things are uh, with the pandemic and determine if we can resume in-person worship or not. Uh, but for the Advent and Christmas season, plan on joining us online, either on Facebook or on YouTube. The season of Advent begins next week, and we will begin a sermon series titled Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. This is based on a new book of uh, Adam Hamilton's out of Church of the Resurrection, and we will be looking at different names 
of Jesus. And so please be watching your email and your regular mail uh, for things that will enhance your, your Advent journey this season. We have a couple of gifts for you and a couple of um, tools that will be arriving to help you um, get the most out of our sermon series. Todd Seifert will be leading a study on the book Incarnation on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. This will be, happen via Zoom. And so if you are interested in participating with that, please uh, drop us a note in the comments or call the church office so we can get you the Zoom invitation for you to participate in that. Uh, there is a great way that we have to invite your neighborhood to join us for our Advent sermon series, even though it's happening online. We have some yard signs uh, that you can put in your yard, and it gives our website and invites people to come and look at what is going on here at Central. And so if you would like one of those, especially if you live on a street that has a lot of traffic and, and a lot of uh, exposure, please call the church office. You can pick one up here, or if you would rather, we can deliver one to you. And finally, we are going to go ahead and move forward with our Advent and Christmas food drive for Wesley KU and Westwood House. Even though the kids have left for the rest of this semester, we are anticipating that they will return in February, and we want to make sure that the shelves are stocked when they do. There is a list of things that the the pantry specifically needs. You can find that list on our website or on our social media. Please call the church office as well and we can make sure to get you a physical copy of that list. If you would prefer not to shop yourself, but rather uh, donate some money to the cause, you can do that either by sending a check to the church or by donating online. There is a place to put an amount for the KU food drive. Uh, if you do that, we will make sure that uh, we go shopping for you to help stock those shelves. So if you have any questions about that, please call the church office. Our closing hymn this day is Open My Eyes That I May See. The words will appear on your screen. Please join in singing. Now receive this benediction. Go to seek the lost and bind up the injured. Go to strengthen the weak and encourage the faint-hearted. Go to seek justice and love mercy. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.